Wow, we are so glad you're here. We're excited to be here on this beautiful Sunday morning. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all stand up and sing with us. So stand up and we'll get started. Lord, thanks for this awesome day you've given us to live for you. We're excited about uh, singing. We're excited to open up our hearts to you, Lord. We know this has been another long week for a lot of folks. Uh, with uh, COVID and all the other things going on and jobs and closings. But, Lord, we know that our hope is in you, our faith is in you, and we look forward to what you're going to do and how you're going to uh, work through us in these coming days. And we uh, give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. And welcome to Discovery. Thank you to our members who voted last week to approve our 2021 budget. We are looking forward to seeing what God does in and through Discovery next year. If you're a regular attender, be on the lookout this week for our annual staff Christmas card in your mail. See if you can be the first one to guess the carol. Speaking of Christmas, this, this just won't do. Hang on a second. Ah, there we go. That's better. Now, where were we? Ah yes, we hope you will join us on Christmas Eve 
either in person or online. We'll be having our services at 4 and 5.30 p.m. and both hours will be streamed online as well. We will also be having our annual Happy Birthday Jesus party at the 4 o'clock service for kids 4 years old through 5th grade. Now registration will be required for both the main service and the kids service due to our limited space. So head to the events page at dfchurch.com or in the Church Center app to get your spot reserved. Our monthly Shine Pantry is this Saturday and we need a few more people to help get things ready. You see, this month we have an opportunity to give participants in the monthly pantry a Christmas gift bag. So we're looking for five more volunteers to help pack these bags on Thursday, December 17th from 10 a.m. to noon here at Discovery. We also need two more people to bag the food and toiletries on Friday, December 18th from 10 a.m. to noon, also here at Discovery Fellowship Church. If you're available to help, either of those two days, then just click the link on the Shine page of our website under the Outreach tab. And make sure you follow us on social media and subscribe to us on YouTube as we will be releasing a few extra things this Christmas season. And now, we invite you again to listen along to this morning's Advent reading. saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then join us as we continue in our worship. Ever compare 
singing this morning, folks. Welcome. Good to see you here at Discovery Church, and welcome to those of you who are joining us online this morning. Appreciate you being a part of our worship time together. If you have been here, or if you've been um, joining us online, then perhaps you know that, or you'll remember that we have been studying together the book of Colossians uh, in the New Testament, and uh, if you've missed any of those sessions, you can certainly just catch up real quickly by going online to our, uh, our website and catch some of those prior messages. But this morning, we're going to go in a little bit of a different direction, as you can see from the slide and uh, from your bulletins this morning, if you have one, in as much as tis the season. So let's pray as we prepare to take a look at God's words this morning. And so this morning, uh, Lord, we want to do that. We've already lift our voices to you in praise and just acknowledged uh, the hope that we have and who you are. Pray this morning, Lord, that you would instruct us by your spirit as we take a look at scripture. And we ask in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Um, like me, some of you may be uh, fans of C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia series. Um, if so, then perhaps you'll remember um, a memorable line that's found in the beloved children's classic, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It goes like this. It is winter in Narnia and has been for ever so long. Always winter, but never Christmas. And though we are just on the cusp of uh, winter here in Colorado, uh, I think those words pretty aptly describe this bleak, season that our world is in, always winter, but never Christmas. Uh, to borrow from C.S. Lewis's images and transport them into our world, it was in fact just last winter, 2019, that the white witch first cast her spell that still has us, as it were, under her grip. Under gray skies, she introduced a novel 
microscopic virus into our atmosphere that spread around the globe as quickly as fingers of frost across a de December window pane, and before long, people all across the world um, were confined indoors, and schools were closed, and businesses were shuttered, and ICUs at capacity, and world economies frozen. And uh, even after the 2020 calendar's pages flipped from spring to summer, there was still a chill in our nation's air from social unrest and violent protests and wildfires and hurricanes and a tumultuous presidential race. Summer 2020 gave way to fall. The leaves turned. The election has passed. Uh, scaled down Thanksgiving holiday has come and gone. And now December 25th is just around the corner. But it doesn't seem much like Christmas. Let's skip Christmas this year. That's the title of a song by the musician Rodney Crowell that came out actually in 2018, uh, a year before the pandemic. But listen to these lyrics and tell me if they don't sound almost prophetic today. Let's skip Christmas this year. Darling, what do you say? Can't we just let it slide like it was any old day? We'll tell our family and friends that we still love them a ton, but we've just taken ill and we won't be much fun. We're contagious, we fear. Can't you imagine their sneer? If we just go ahead and skip Christmas this year. Now, by no means am I trying to be uh, Mr. Grinch or Pastor Scrooge this morning. Um, I love Christmas. And I'm sure that there are some of us who are here today or watching online today. And we would say life is good. We have our health. We have our family. We still have our jobs. Uh, and we anticipate a wonderful Christmas celebration. And so we sing angels we have heard on high and glory in the highest. And it lifts our spirits as we think about the first Noel. But perhaps there are others here today or watching online. And you may not feel that same lift. You might feel that life's not fair. It's too hard. Things are not right. And st instead of a celebration in a couple of weeks, you anticipate perhaps being alone or facing the ongoing reminders in your life of pain and loss and sadness this Christmas. Then too, I imagine that there may be those of us that have become perhaps fairly cynical about the whole thing. People are more socially distant and self-centered of necessity than ever these days. And we'll go through the motions of Christmas while quietly thinking to ourselves, is there really any hope for this world? Now, I don't know where you might be on that spectrum, but if you are among those that are struggling this Christmas of 2020, then perhaps you can identify a little bit more closely with where the nation of Israel was in the middle of the uh, prophet Isaiah's days. Isaiah certainly lived in some dark and seemingly hopeless times. And yet in his day, God spoke to and through this prophet to his people, and he gave them the hope that they needed. The book of Isaiah, chapter 42, is where I'd like for us to turn our attention this morning, if we could, for just a few moments. Um, Isaiah 42 was written, the original audience was the southern kingdom of Judah, written right around 690 BC, more than 2,700 years ago. In Isaiah's day, the northern kingdom of Israel had uh, been taken captive by the Assyrian Empire some 30 years earlier, and they were deported. They were never to be reconstituted as a nation again. And so Isaiah was writing his prophecy to people in the southern kingdom of Judah who were headed towards that very same fate because of their national unfaithfulness. 
In the book of Deuteronomy, some 700 years earlier, God had promised that this could happen. If his people as a nation were unfaithful to him and to his covenant that they had with him, God would bring about certain specific and catastrophic consequences for their unfaithfulness and for their unbelief. He promised, and he warned, and he was patient, but the nation of Israel wouldn't have it, and so the hammer fell in 722 B.C., just as God said in his word. For Judah, the southern kingdom, it wouldn't happen for another 90 years after Isaiah's day, but it would just as surely happen. And this time at the hand and at the swords of the Babylonians and the Persians. And so, contextually, the prophetic words of Isaiah 42 were directed towards the nation of Judah, looking forward from their day as they, as a people, would be dominated by another nation. They would be enslaved to another king. And so, in the midst of their catastrophic lives, uh, they looked at the world in which they lived, and they would be asking questions. Like, is there any hope? Why is God so far away? And how is God going to make this right? Now, as difficult as the year 2020 has been for us, it's difficult, I think, for you and I to imagine what it would be like to live in exile um, under a, the domination of a foreign king or under the rule of some other government in slavery, but we can relate to those kinds of questions that the people of Judah would have asked. When the situation of the country or the world around you seems to be out of control, we tend to ask these same sorts of questions, don't we? Why is God so far away from me and my situation? Why is he allowing this to happen to me or to our country? How or is God ever going to make this right? In Isaiah 42, we have the answer in a word. It's Jesus. God's word never fails. Whatever he has said, whatever he has promised, will always come to pass. He promised that Israel would be taken captive, and they were. He promised that Judah would be taken into exile for 70 years, and they were. He promised that the nation would be restored once again to the land, and they were. And he promised that he would send a Messiah, a Christ, a deliverer, to save the people from their sins, and he did. Isaiah 42 is a prophecy about the coming of Jesus the Christ. And we need to understand this morning that it is both history and prophecy. It speaks of something that happened in the past. It was future for Judah, but it's past for us. But it also speaks to something that is yet to come. And it's a description of what this one who is to come does and how he does it. And so, it should be, I think, a great encouragement to us this Christmas 2020. Let's take a look, if we could, at the scripture this morning from Isaiah chapter 42. The text says, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. 
to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That's my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place. And new things, I declare, before they spring into being, I announce them to you. Now, there is an awful lot in that passage. Um, but from verse 1 forward, we can get the sense that in the midst of difficulty, then and now, God has his man for the job. We read in the text that he upholds him. He chose him for this work. His soul delights in him, he says, and he has put his spirit upon him. The Jewish people today, those who still hold to some semblance of an orthodox religious perspective, they believe that this scripture is talking allegorically about the nation of Israel. However, that is a stretch from a grammatical and historical perspective, and it really doesn't make sense from the context. What does make perfect sense is that God, through the prophet Isaiah, is talking about his son, Jesus. He's telling us that the eternal Son of God is commissioned by the eternal Father and empowered by the eternal Spirit to do a particular specific work. And lest there be any doubt about who Isaiah 42 is talking about, uh, Jesus lets the cat out of the bag, as it were, in Luke chapter 4. Now, I won't read this all for the sake of time this morning, but in that passage, we are told that Jesus has been ministering in the region of the Galilee, and he travels back to his hometown of Nazareth, and once there, he decides to go to church on Saturday. He is a popular, itinerant, traveling rabbi at this point. And so, as the guest of honor there, he gets to read the daily scripture passage. And lo and behold, he turns right to Isaiah chapter 61, which echoes and expands on what we just read in chapter 42, about the Spirit of the Lord being upon him, and why he came and what it was that he was commissioned by God to do. After Jesus reads that, listen to these follow-on words from verses 20 and 21. Then he, that is Jesus, rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He said to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That boom you just heard was Jesus dropping the mic, right? For his audience that day, he could not have been more clear. He could not have more clearly said to them, I am the servant of Isaiah 42, 43, 49, 52, 53, and chapter 61. So it's no surprise then. When Jesus grows and begins his public ministry and he stands on the banks of the Jordan River to be baptized by John, and the Spirit descends upon him, Scripture says, as a dove, like a dove, and a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, to indicate the support of his Father and the empowerment of the Spirit in him for a specific mission. And what is the mission? Verse 1 of Isaiah 42 tells us, He will bring forth justice to the nations. Justice. It's something that so many people want these days, but it seems so elusive. The concept of justice is, frankly, a bit of a loaded term today. We have people, of course, who are clamoring for social justice. We have justice warriors we have electoral justice. We have Supreme Court justices. But it seems that all of that having to do with justice has a particular ideology or political connotation attached to it. So it can get a little bit controversial at times. But justice need not be controversial. One dictionary I read defines justice as 
morally correct and fair. Another defines it as conforming to what is true. Unfortunately, justice is such a fluid idea today because in 2020, truth is a moving target in our culture. We are supposed to conform to truth, but truth has become individualized. So how can we even have any kind of a standard of justice? If morality is simply in the eye of the beholder, then how can we expect to come to any sense of agreement on what justice really is? What the scripture in Isaiah 42 verse 1 tells us is that we, not, we need not be confused or fear or despair because no matter how humanity attempts to manipulate truth and no matter how much humanity attempts to redefine morality, there is one who sees it clearly. There is one who can tell the difference. There is one who sets the objective irrefutable, absolute standard, and that one is Jesus. So to say that Jesus comes to bring forth justice is to say that Jesus comes to align us with what is true, which is to say that Jesus ultimately aligns our thinking and our living, our practices to God. So that's what it means to bring forth justice, to lift it up, to show it off, to make it clear. When Jesus dropped the mic and when he sat down in the narrative in Luke, I think it's interesting what he did not say. As I said, he quoted from the prophet Isaiah, but in fact, he only quoted a portion of that passage. He stopped right in the middle and abruptly sat down, and as you saw, he said, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. What he did not say was the second part of Isaiah 61, verse 2, which says, and to proclaim the day of vengeance of our God. Vengeance is the Hebrew word nakam. It can mean retribution. It can mean uh, righteous recompense. It can mean justice. Jesus knew very well how the passage goes on. But he also knew that at his first advent, his first coming was the time to proclaim grace and mercy and forgiveness and proclaim justice. But the ultimate dispensation of that justice will come later when he comes back to set things right. In his first coming, he comes to offer forgiveness of sin. In his second coming, he comes to deal with it, you name it, abuse, sex trafficking, manipulation, fraud, financial impropriety, grief, cheating, deception, murder, all of it dealt with. But notice the manner in which Jesus proclaims and brings forth justice in his first coming. Again, from Isaiah 42 verses 2 and 3. It says he will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. Jesus brings forth justice, but he, he brings it forth with gentle, gentleness and, and mercy and kindness towards those who need it. Now, I love this, this imagery of gentleness. To bring about justice... Normally you'd think that requires strength. But strong does not mean harsh. Strong does not mean reckless. We are accustomed, I think, to thinking of strength as, as opposite to gentleness and to softness and to tenderness. But this isn't always true. Think about the strength of a mother and her loving care towards her little children. Think about the strength of a massive horse as it walks through its paces with a small child riding securely on its back. Strength can be gentle. I read an account this past week um, that during World War I, the British fighter pilots made something of an amazing discovery. They discovered that 
thick layers of silk actually stopped low-velocity shrapnel better than steel. So what they did was, as they would fly and engage in aerial combat, rather than wearing their standard issue metal helmets, they would wind pure silk around their heads and then wear leather horse riding helmets on top of that silk. Scientists still aren't sure exactly what it is that gives silk its strength, but it's true. In certain situations, soft, gentle, tender silk can prove stronger than cold, hard steel. Jesus showed us the same holds true for human character. Jesus showed us that gentleness, a heart that is soft towards others, and tenderness are in fact qualities of great strength. Some of us may be here today or you may be watching online and perhaps you feel a bit like a, a bruised reed, a reed that has been battered back and forth by the difficulties of life. Some of those difficulties may not be a, a, you know, any fault of your own. Some of them may in fact be as a result of some poor choices that you've made. But regardless of how you got to the point where you feel like that reed has been bent and just one more blow is, is going to snap you in two. You need to have hope and have faith. The Savior knows exactly where you are. And others of us may feel a bit like a smoldering wick that's just barely holding on to our flame. Perhaps your own struggle with sin leaves you feeling incredibly discouraged or perhaps the circumstances of your life or those that you love just feel so unfair. And maybe your faith is just holding on by a few flickers of the flame. And as you look at this world, you just can't really make much sense about what's going on. And so we are inclined at times to say, God, why are you so far away? God, when are you going to sort this out? And you doubt and you struggle. If that's you, then you too need to have faith in this Savior. He is gentle with those who are in a vulnerable position. A bruised reed, it says, he will not break. And a faintly burning wick, he will not quench. That is a great picture of the tenderness of the Lord. His, his strength is displayed in his tenderness towards us. And there's something else that we can be assured of from this passage here in Isaiah 42. And that is that he will see it through to the end. There is no term limit for the one who establishes justice. There is no discouragement, nor will he grow tired and give up. The eternal purposes of God are met with the resolve of this Savior. You can see it in the repetition there in those first four verses. Verse 1, he will bring forth justice to the nations. Verse 3, he will faithfully bring forth justice. Verse 4, he will not grow discouraged until he has established justice. And then verses 5 through 9 function as the tale to this passage. The servant songs of Isaiah have sort of a unique poetic feature in which they have a head, in this case, verses 1 to 4, and a tail, verses 5 to 9. And the tail simply functions to emphasize and confirm what was previously stated in the head. This tale confirms that God has given the servant this task, and he does so, as the creator of all things and the Lord of that creation, it confirms, verses 6 and 7, that God will empower his servant for the task. And lastly, it guarantees the success of the mission, verses 8 and 9, because there is no one like God on this earth. In verse 5, in fact, the, the name used of God is Ha'el in the Hebrew. It means he who is indeed the transcendent God, to be transcendent means to be boundless, to not have any restriction. So if you summarize the verse, he who is indeed the transcendent God, he is the one who created the heavens and spread out the earth and breathed life and gave spirit to people. He is transcendent, but the same almighty limitless God is also near. 
Again, verse 6 says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Jesus came to get, give us light, to bring light into our darkness. John chapter 1 Beginning in verse 4, says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Again, in that passage in Luke 4, verse 18, it says that Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Folks, that is the gospel the good news of how we can be realigned with God. His Son, the light in the darkness, promises to forgive us by the shedding of His blood, that is, His bloody death, and thus sets us free from the dungeon of sin and death that we're in. This is divine justice. This is how people, anyone who is willing, can be realigned to God. And one day, the world will have to reckon with divine justice because God is supreme. Verse 8 says, I am the Lord. That's yud heh vav heh Y-H-W-H, Yahweh. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. All creation will experience his justice. All creation will one day be aligned to him. So we should realize that the celebration of Christmas 2020 is not just about the coming, the miraculous coming of a baby in a manger, nor is it simply the coming of the Son of God into this world to teach you and I how we ought to live, nor is it only about the possibility of forgiveness of sins, as wonderful as all of that is. Christmas, the coming of this Savior, marks the beginning of God's justice. All people, for all time, aligned to Him. All creation aligned to Him. It began at His first coming. It will be completed when He comes back. Jesus is the hope for the world because only through Him people are aligned to God. We hope in Jesus because only through him is this world properly aligned. So, we can come to Christmas 2020 with hope, with faith, with joy, with anticipation. What we experience now will not always be. God is doing something transcendent. He's doing something supernatural through his son. And if you've placed your personal faith in him, then you've already begun to experience that. You will experience it in its totality when Jesus comes back for his church. So, this Christmas, let Christmas bolster your faith and enliven your hope in God. I'll close with this this morning. In the old Supreme Court building in Lausanne, Switzerland, hangs a huge painting, a mural by uh, the artist Paul Robert. He was asked to paint this a tremendous mural in 1905, and the title of the work is Justice Lifts the Nations. And so you see in the foreground there, if you can see it, uh, all sorts of litigants, the wife against her husband, the architect against the builder, debtors and creditors going at it in court. Above them stands the Swiss judges. How will they judge the litigation? The artist's answer is, by justice. But what is interesting is in many renditions of Lady Justice and uh, including this one from the United States, you typically see a blindfolded woman with the scales of justice in one hand and the sword in the other. She is impartial, hence the, the blindfold. She weighs the facts on the scale and her sword is poised, ready to strike when necessary. But not so in Switzerland. There, justice is personified by this imposing woman dressed in 
radiant white. In her right hand, she lifts the scales, indicating judicial fairness. Her head is surrounded by light, which may suggest divine illumination. The 12 judges surround her, looking up to her for guidance. In her left hand, she holds a sword, but it is not vertical. Instead, it is pointing directly to a Bible, open and accessible to the judges and to the litigants alike. I think this artwork sort of encapsulates a message central to Jesus in the courtroom of life. Justice comes when the word is made flesh and dwelt among us. Justice comes when Jesus comes. And so this Christmas, even more than Merry Christmas and Pass the Eggnog, may our hope be Revelation 22, in verse 20. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for uh, these words from Scripture that remind us of the hope that we have in Jesus. I pray, Father, that you would lift our eyes, that you would lift our spirits this holiday. May we see Jesus more clearly than we ever have. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.
Thank you, Amanda. Very beautiful. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, if you are particularly observant, you may have noticed that that instrument over there is a brand new um, grand piano that has been gifted to Discovery just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the giver of that gift is a, is a faithful uh, member here at Discovery Fellowship. And I know that Bruce has been trying to twist her arm to get her to come and uh, do a little mini concert for us on that piano. It'll be fantastic if she will. Would you stand along with me this morning as we prepare to be dismissed? Father, thank you for the time to worship, to lift our voices in praise, to be reminded of the great hope that we have in Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for our Savior. Tune our hearts towards heaven and towards Christmas this year. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>